Hey, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about paying attention to the area of greatest discomfort that we typically run away from. Maybe it's just me. I'm the kind of person who is not necessarily wired to enjoy my areas of discomfort. I'm definitely challenge driven. But I also know that as an entrepreneur, somebody who's overcome multiple diseases and things like that, quite frankly, just simply as a mom, I have avoided the things many times, it's a good thing, that would take me down a path that would probably take too long to recoup, or maybe is going to stir up drama, or is going to stir up all kinds of things and take me off track. But when I'm Opening this topic with you, this is not like paying attention to toxic people in your life and how to navigate away in 10 easy steps. This is paying attention to the area of greatest discomfort within ourselves, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's something coming up from our heart, whether it's something coming from past experience, or it just could be a deeply held belief that causes us enormous discomfort whenever we're, anytime we go anywhere near it. Now, I have to let you know, so many of you are going to be so surprised <laughs> that with all this energy and all this emotion and all this vitality, <laughs> yeah, I can turn into a drama mama in three easy steps if I'm not careful. But I've learned as well that my emotions can reveal to me a lot of things that I never would have considered many years ago. What do I mean by that? When I decided to relocate, uh, 2015, 16, I decided I'm relocating to Arizona. I knew, and if you haven't heard a previous podcast where I talk about how I weaned off of opiates and all the autoimmune conditions I had, make sure that you listen to that. But I knew if I didn't get into a state that had number one, dry heat, which was going to be really good for my body. Number two, more sunshine than it had rain, which was going to be really good for my body. And number three, very important, the use of medical cannabis. I was likely going to spend the rest of my life on opiates, anti-inflammatories, and battling with my body. And something I'll never forget, one time I was spending some time with God and the thought came to me, do I avoid the discomfort that it would take to change my life in this way, in the same way that maybe I'm avoiding other things. Like I, I was quickly taken back to how I used to chase after things that were challenging. And I would chase after things in my 20s when I was bodybuilding, when I was working two jobs, when I had a dream of starting my own company. And then even when I was raising my kids and I was running my companies, I would look at areas of discomfort like, okay, I'm a solutionist. How can I fix this thing? How can I come up with a solution? So it, it's not that like I was in denial, but I'm going to remove this discomfort and make it something where I get stronger in. And I remember thinking, what the heck does that look like to, to try to wean off of all these opiates and go against well-meaning medical advice? Mind you, I had fired all the quacks who had told me I would be like this forever. And I had to examine, so where are the areas of discomfort, Sandy, and how do you plow through them? Or here's something you might want to write down. How do you stop denying and disconnecting from these emotions? and find out what they're actually trying to say. So I had to hone in on, I can't stay where I'm at anymore because like my body is literally hurting most, 50% uh, of the time of my day. Like literally from the time I would wake up till I would go to bed, 50% of the time, even on opiates, even on anti-inflammatories, I would have a migraine or whatever. So this com discomfort is telling me a few things. It's telling me, girl, if you don't change where you live and change what's going on in your life, that 50% is liable to become 100%. That, that difficulty is liable to become a long-term disability. That discomfort is liable to become bigger than you and you might not ever be able to overcome it again. My body was screaming for relief. As I began to navigate that, well, like, what does that look like? Because every time I would try to go to the gym when I lived in Kansas City, I'd end up hurting myself. Well, duh, that's a really 
unintelligent is what I'll say. I wanted to say stupid, but <laughs> I'm, as a very unintelligent thing to do is go to the gym on opiates and prednisone. I don't think so. Great way to get hurt. So I knew if I'm going to get my body moving, if I'm going to get exercising again, I have to get in tune with what actually hurts and what actually is a byproduct of taking things that were supposed to suppress the hurt. Okay, that opened up a whole different way of thinking. And I thought to myself, so what else am I doing in my life to pacify this physical pain? And what is that pacifying suppressing that I'm supposed to be paying attention to. So I began to do study, long story short, on what actually inflames the body, why environment, environmental conditions, the weather, humidity, um, sunlight, all of that, how that will affect the body. I didn't just like, okay, I'm moving to Arizona and I'm going to get me some weed and I'm going to get off my medication. No, it was very specific. And it took some grueling, I mean, gr like horrific self-assessment. Now, mind you, I was not on opiates and all that because I had hurt myself. It's not because I had a surgery and I never stopped taking them. There were chronic conditions of inflammation that I was battling. And it wasn't just going to go away by saying, okay, God, take away my pain in Jesus' name. I'd been doing that for years. But I knew that in order for the muscles, the fascia, to not be inflamed anymore, I actually have to put pressure on the fascia. I actually need to massage the fascia. I have to work my way through it. I have to help my body to release certain hormones, to release certain things, to help it to start recovering rather than just surviving. And that took me on a journey spiritually like nothing I've ever gone on in my whole life. Far too many of us deny, disassociate, and disconnect from what not only our body, but our place of greatest discomfort is trying to tell us. I remember when I started my first online kitchen business and it was a dream come true. Like I, I, I was just like learning like a junkie. Any free moment in my day, I was learning and applying and learning and applying and grew that thing to over $30,000 in profit my first year and went to my first million by my second year and have never made less than that. But what's interesting is every time I hit an area of discomfort, I didn't deny it or disconnect it because it's like, okay, get this. It's extremely uncomfortable <laughs> to learn how to code a website when you've never done that before. It's very uncomfortable to try to put to piece together on a shoestring budget graphics and copywriting and the whole gamut for your brand. And there were many times when it was so uncomfortable, I would literally smash my hand on my desk and like say a few expletives and think, Ugh! but I wouldn't give up because there was no way in hell I was going to give up on my dream. But I would rather than disconnect and deny this discomfort, I would go do something else and allow my brain to come up with solutions while I was actively doing something else. So I applied that principle when it came to this whole discomfort about relocating. Okay, I, I made my intention. I did a lots of study how to support my body, started even weaning in Kansas City. We couldn't even use CBD at that time for crying out loud. My pain management doctor said, if you start using CBD, I'm going to have to cut you off overnight. And I'm thinking like, whatever, I'll end up dying from the withdrawals. And so I began to look at how can I help my body to adapt to some regular discomfort that it hasn't had, and will it, if I bring in some, if you will, strategic discomfort, will it abandon its support of this greater discomfort that it's actually made like as a part of my identity? What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, what I did is I took my work schedule down to like five to 10 hours a week. And I didn't just like lay on the couch and meditate and pray for God to take everything away. No, I filled the additional 
30 to 35 hours with acupuncture, massage, studying how to help the body detox without a ton of discomfort and side effects, why the support of certain neurotransmitter type amino acids would help the body, how to support my dopamine level naturally. When I began to discover that there are certain chemicals in the brain that when they're off can create this horrific discomfort that actually I needed to pay attention to because if I supported it, my body would literally release the discomfort. It would just start releasing it. It would release it through sweating. It would release it through deeper sleep. It released it through being able to process through, through some things I couldn't before. But what I had to do is I had to face the discomfort full on, take myself into super hot and super cold bath treatments, put myself in a situation of literally be still for 30 minutes. Like, okay, when you have chronic pain and you have five brains, not one, I call it a community up there, and you try to be still for 30 minutes, like my brain was thinking like within the first two minutes, my neck hurts. <laughs> and two minutes in, like I should be doing this other thing. But I did some st very specific, if you will, discomforts that actually started getting me really strong again, mentally, emotionally. I bought an infrared sauna. It's a portable thing. You could literally buy it from Amazon. It's the coolest thing. You could put a folding chair inside of it. It was in my room, mind you. It is like 10 degrees in Kansas City. And I got my infrared sauna. I think it's like a couple hundred dollars. And you literally put yourself in there, your head sticking out. You look like you're in this little tent. And you're sitting there. <laughs> and I would put on some good like meditative type music that would help my mind to relax. And I would sit there for 15 to 20 minutes. Now, the first couple times I did this, I literally thought somebody's going to find me dead in my house. <laughs> I cannot handle this heat. I'm sweating. I'm dying. This is how I'm going to go home to Jesus. I'm going to sweat to death. But what was something is every time I put my body in a position of intentional discomfort, my pain started going away. I was getting my body used to having infrared type heat, which is very, that's kind of the heat you have here in Arizona without any humidity. And initially my body was thanking me in some very uncomfortable ways, like my face would break out or I'd get all kinds of rashes all over my chest or like I would get these swelling blotches on my arm or my quads that would like itch like heck. And it was like, what the heck's going on? My body was getting rid of what is what was intoxicating me with all these toxins. And it's something because as I began to identify other places of discomfort and relocating, I began the walk of the single greatest transformation of my life. I began to ask myself, so why are you so afraid of moving so far away? Well, what if there's nobody there to help me? Uh, what if it's, I don't even know anybody. Uh, what if it's like different than anything I've ever been to before? So what I did is I flew to Arizona for a week and got a rent a car and put tons of miles in it, drove around, looked at everything, rented a house, got myself ready, and allowed my mind to begin to blueprint familiar areas that when I got there, those would be very familiar to me. But it was very different. I mean, it's this is a different world. It's like living on an island in Arizona. I love it. Going from the Midwest in Kansas City where everything's about, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say it, fatty food, <laughs> barbecue, <laughs> humidity, and uh, discomfort. I love all you people in Kansas City, but it was not where I was supposed to be. <laughs> And then coming here, we're like, okay, everybody's walking around in their shorts and everybody has on like one third the amount of clothes everybody does in Kansas City. And I am feeling really uncomfortable in my swollen, overweight, physically weak state. But I had to face 
head on. You want to die in Kansas City or you want to go to Arizona? I had a rheumatologist tell me over 20 years ago, if you moved to Arizona, you probably had 20, 30 years to your life. And so I knew that I was stepping into something that was not only designed for me, but it was something that I really felt like heaven was saying to me, you need to go there. You need to go there. I was like way out of my comfort zone as somebody who suffered trauma and PTSD, like what the heck you're taking me 24 hours away from where I was. And yet it was the greatest thing because, you know, once you, once you go that far away, there's no turning back. It's not like I really had anything to turn back to anyways in the Midwest in Kansas city. And I remember when I got here, one of the first things I began to do is walk and drive into the mountains. Mountains have always had an incredible draw for me. Mountains speak to me like nothing. Oceans and mountains speak to me like nothing spiritually. So I began to spend 50% of my time in the mountains <laughs> when I was here. I'd, I'd chase the sun in the morning. Literally, I'd get in my truck and I would drive to where I knew the mountains were and try to chase the sunrise. I would go hit sunsets. I would find all kinds of trails I could walk on. Now, what I was doing is I was overcoming my fear of being in unfamiliar surroundings by myself. I made sure that somebody had my phone tracking where I was, but I took myself to some very uncomfortable discomforts, <laughs> discomforting areas in my mind, and even that would cause me to face head on some of the terrifying traumatic events that I had been through. I remember one time when I um, made a goal after regular walking and getting used to the heat, and I'm now still weaning off of things and learning how to take cannabis and stuff like that, there is a path that is over by, I think it's over by Usury Mountain, or it might be by Superstition. <laughs> I can't remember right now, but it's like an eight mile path. And so as you walk on this trail, and it's all flat ground, you're not like well, nothing's flat in Arizona, but <laughs> it's just kind of hilly. It's not like up in a mountain and you're literally walking like four or five miles in and it's four or five miles back, depending on how, what, what you take. Some people are riding bikes in there. Some people are walking. This particular day was 90 degrees and I loved the heat. Every time I was in the heat, it felt so good. My goal became now to just be how soaking, dripping wet can I get to detox? And I knew I'm going to get in the middle of the desert and be scared out of my wits. No, let me, let me tell you it Sandy style. Be scared shitless. <laughs> I know that I am literally going to trigger myself. I know that one of my greatest fears is being all by myself and not being able to take care of myself, which was irrational, totally irrational, because it's just not in my makeup. I can figure stuff out. I do all the time. But I knew in this setting, there's just the desert, the sand, the tarantulas, <laughs> the cactus, the sunshine, you, and God. And I like to refer to that walk as a deliverance walk. Because <laughs> I began to walk and I had my music and I was enjoying it. And I, I noticed the further in I got, my heart rate was actually relaxing. I, I didn't expect that. And the further in I got, and there's signs on which way to go, and there really wasn't a whole lot of people out. They were probably because it was in the, a weekday in the afternoon. And when I got to like mile four, it was the wildest thing because it was if something triggered in my mind and said, you are now in a place where people will never find you. <laughs> and I remember I started to cry. And I, I literally had uncontrollable sobbing come over me. I was so afraid. Like my legs started to shake. My hands were shaking. And it was something because right there in the middle of the desert, I knelt down and I said, God, if there's ever been a time, you need to show me that you are God. It's now. 
I need this discomfort to become my freedom. And I kid you not, a dove that God has always used to speak to me. Mind you, there's all kinds of doves around here in Arizona, but not in the middle of the desert. <laughs> They're usually not resting on a cactus. <laughs> They're just not. A dove flew right over me and sat down right on a, a plant that was by me. And I remember just sitting there for just a few minutes and I heard God say to me, you usually sing your way out. Why don't you dance your way out? So right there in the middle of the desert, I started dancing and I just started worshiping God and twirling around and putting my hands in the air. And then I started screaming all kinds of expletives at the devil and every single discomfort and fear and terror that was in my head and all the insecurities that were trying to resist me and all the stories that were trying to combat me and all the feelings that were threatening to suffocate and kill me. <laughs> And by that time, I was definitely soaking wet with tears and, and sweat and everything. And that dove was still there. <laughs> and I began to walk back out. And it was so fun because every mile that I walked out, I realized that I had faced one of my greatest fears head on. And it actually had made me physically, emotionally, and spiritually stronger. It actually had showed me what I was made of that I didn't realize I was made of, that I was made for hot places like that. I was made for difficulty, that my DNA is designed with a warrior-like uh, framework. And that framework cannot live in denial, disassociation, and disconnecting for very long. That the inner wiring and coding within me, which is in you too, is not meant to cohabitate with denying and disassociating and disconnecting. I truly believe that a lot of my autoimmune conditions, while there's definitely medical evidence of trauma can cause that, but I believe that I was going like counter to my wiring like in a huge way. You can't do that to a computer. You can't. You can't take a computer that's not loaded with specific graphics cards and processors and other things and start playing a bunch of games on it and then run your business on the side. You can't. The games, that software will overtake all the business software and start corrupting things. It's, it's the craziest thing. Because the framework... And the wiring on that computer is not meant for that kind of rigorous heat processing, heavy graphics, deep inner coding that games demand. And it's equally interesting if you take a gaming computer and put a bunch of business software on it, sometimes it'll clock over hot. <laughs> the, the processor will overwork trying to figure out what it's doing. That's exactly what happens in many of our lives when we start taking our inner wiring and we start feeding this habit of pacifying ourselves. Face it, we live in a society where it is politically correct to just pacify all your fears, to just blame somebody else, some other situation, you know, to like sit down and have a party with your feelings and like all your insecurities, just like pack them in a bag and carry them with you everywhere you go and identify that place of incredible discomfort and run away from it as fast as you can. But I believe that with fitness, with health, with our relationships, small business owners, finances. I remember a self-imposed constraint, a self-imposed place of great discomfort that I put myself in to pay off multiple six figures of debt. And that intentional discomfort that was greater than all that debt was so blueprinted in my mind as I paid it off and paid it off and paid it off and didn't allow myself to have all kinds of silly things and, and not many rewards at all, that it, my intention was to get rid of that freaking debt and never get there again 
to the point that my mainframe is now wired with this like warning, warning, we're in trouble <laughs> whenever a whole lot of debt comes around. The same kind of thing happens when I get in a situation and I start hearing familiar thoughts, old thoughts, old patterns, you're not going to be able to get yourself out of here. You're going to be all by yourself. You're not going to be able to get yourself out of here. People are going to find you dead. You're not going to be able to figure this out. You're going to be all by yourself. You're going to be all by yourself. You're going to be all by yourself. Because I had changed that day in the middle of the desert, my wiring back in alignment with my inner framework of being a warrior. The things that we have to do are identify that place of discomfort and journal it. I have a four-hour class in my inner circle where I talk about this. To start paying attention to what the voices in your head are saying. Start paying attention to what not some ominous resistance is telling you, but what are you telling you? What is this chatter in your head? What is the chatter telling you? Identify that place of discomfort, then look that thing in the face and go. Go like a football player looking at all these strong opposition on the line, but you are going to where you need to go to to get that score. Here's the thing. You've got to identify that place of discomfort and you have to go face it, paying attention to it. Because I totally believe that our greatest opportunity is completely aligned with where our greatest place of discomfort is. I figured that out now after a couple years of being in the gym, a couple years of being here in Arizona, learning to find my way, learning to make new friends and different things like that. Another thing was, where do your feelings threaten you? The places where my feelings, where your th feelings may be threatening us could be the accumulation of stories we've been telling ourselves for so many years, we don't even know the difference between truth or lie anymore. So we've got to look at what are those feelings threatening us with and seriously pull out this card. What is the worst that could happen <laughs> if what that feeling threatens you with actually happen? Are you, are you going to die? 99.9% .9 of the time, no. You're going to be dismembered 99% of the time, no. Where are your feelings threatening you? Go there. Go there and sometimes I just look at it combatively and threaten my feelings back. <laughs> Where are your insecurities resisting you? Where are the insecurities resisting you? I've noticed this in the gym because for over 20 years, I've had a few different um, injuries, injuries in my sacrum, injuries with tumors on my spine, injuries with like nerve damage in my one foot when they did surgery and cut the nerves by accident. Um, injuries to falling on my back and, and there's a timer. <laughs> Bobby will have to cut that part out. Um, injuries where I literally had learned to protect my whole posterior chain, my whole spinal cord, my backside, my booty, my hammies. Be careful because every time I would fall, I wouldn't just have like a bump or a bruise. I, I, I'd be in a a brace or a cast for crying out loud for two months. And going back to the gym, the number one place, like I could easily acclimate with my upper body. My lower body, it was as if I was two people in one. <laughs> it was as if I had two personalities. This is my upper body and this is my lower body. And I, I had to overcome and I'm still overcoming and still hitting that place of great discomfort that says, protect yourself, protect yourself. You're going to hurt your spine. You're going to throw your back out. You're going to get crippled. You're going to hurt yourself to the point like you can't come back. And all of these other insecurities resisting me to the point that I'm actually lifting at 56 more weight than I did when I was bodybuilding in my 20s <laughs> with my lower body. It's amazing when we walk right into the very things that scare us to death <laughs> and find life. It's amazing when you become the kind of person who examines what your mainframe was made to do, what you were created to do, and how paying attention to the area of greatest discomfort and using your emotional intelligence can actually reveal to you some of your greatest opportunities. This is something I tell a lot of my small business owners in our inner circle. It's something I love to talk about on social media. 
And I would love to hear your story. I'd love to hear your story of what is a huge discomfort. You are looking that freaking thing in the face. You are like David with your slingshot and you are throwing it at that Goliath. What are these feelings that are threatening you and how are you overcoming it? What are these insecurities that you're resisting and finding your truest self in? I'd love to hear that. I'd love to get some amazing guests here on the podcast. And I want to hear how this may have helped you. So the best place to connect with me typically will be on Instagram. I answer all of my DMs on my own. Some of the other channels, it gets overcrowded and I've got a lot of my team. But on Instagram, you can DM me directly. Send me your story. Send me a short video. Send me a before and after photo. I can't wait to meet you. And remember, let's all pay attention to our area of greatest discomfort because our greatest, our greatest opportunity is waiting for us. Talk to you guys soon.